Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Macmillan Online Teachers' Days. My name is Louise Connolly, and I am the head of educational consultants and teacher training at Macmillan. And I'm delighted that we have a very interesting program. It's new this year for 2018, program of sessions, teacher training sessions for private language schools. Today is the first one, and in April, on Tuesday, the 17th of April, we will be holding another event at the same time from 11 to half 12. And finally, in May, on Wednesday, the 9th of May, again from 11 to half 12, we will be holding our last event. We hope with these events to offer you a program of very practical, relevant sessions where you can find ideas to put to use immediately in your classes. We um, have invited speakers and authors with lots of teacher training experience and experience in the classroom to share their insights with you today. 2018 is a very special year for Macmillan. Those of you out there who um, attended face-to-face -face events last year, you will remember that we were celebrating the 30th anniversary of Macmillan in Spain. Well, this year, 2018, we're celebrating 175 years of Macmillan, the 175th anniversary, which is quite a few years, really, um, in, two, in 1843, the brothers Macmillan, Daniel and Alexander, founded the company and they started publishing very, very well-known, well, have become well-known and universally loved authors such as Thomas Hardy, uh, poets such as W.B. Yeats, Rudyard Kipling, um, the writer, obviously, famous writer and one much loved by um, readers of children's stories, um, Lewis Carroll, um, to name but a few, and also started publishing textbooks for schools very early on, and we continue to do so today. So we would like to celebrate this year with all of you this birthday, which is so important to us. I would also like to invite you to um, post comments on your experience of attending these events. We have a Twitter account it, and the hashtag is hashtag um, Macmillan Online Teachers Day. So please do post your comments. Um, we want to make these events, these online events, as interactive as possible. And last year we got a lot of feedback from teachers saying, we really like the fact that we can watch these events from the comfort of our home, from the staff room at school, but also we need to maintain a certain level of interaction. And to this end, we've introduced um, what we call interactions or short chats between you, um, the audience and the speakers. We call them have your says and we will announce them and you will have a you will see a, a window that appears on your screen and you will be able to write your answer uh, we will uh, the speaker will give feedback on that we may also um, launch a poll or at the end of each session we will give you a couple of minutes to send in any questions or comments that you may have on the talk on the ideas and activities demonstrated in the talk um, before we move on to the next speaker. So, with no further ado, but with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Scott Thornbury, who really doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, I think you all probably have come across Scott in many different contexts out there. Um, as you know, he's um, got a lot of experience as a teacher trainer, consultant, he's worked in many different countries, the UK, Spain, Egypt, 
in his native New Zealand. Um, he has um, given sessions on Delta courses, on one which I did so many years ago, I won't say when. And um, obviously is an award-winning and much-loved author um, of many books such as Uncovering Grammar, but most recently the new um, A to Z of ELT. So, welcome Scott. Thank you Louise. Thank you. It's great to be in such illustrious company as Lewis <laughs> Carroll and Rudyard <laughs> Kipling. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, as Louise said, you'll have opportunities to interact with us uh, as we go along. My topic is text. Uh, I've written a book about text called, for, published by Macmillan called Beyond the Sentence and my uh, feelings about text are kind of well captured I think in this quotation by Gunter Kress. Language always happens as text and not as isolated words and sentences. From an aesthetic, social or educational perspective it is the text which is the significant unit of language and I think that's really worth thinking about because we spend a lot of time teaching words, teaching the grammar of sentences uh, before we kind of put them into text. Uh, but I wonder if we might reconsider at times the value of text and have make text the starting point, not just the finishing point of teaching. But of course, texts are complicated. Texts have particular challenges and that's what I want to look at today. In the talk, Unpacking a Text, uh, my metaphor is unpacking, obviously unpacking a, a, a box, a present, whatever. But it's another metaphor which was easier to illustrate is that of kind of peeling an onion. If we think of a text as a kind of onion with lots of different layers, then one way of approaching the text is to take it layer by layer. And this is a way of making text accessible to learners. So let's do that. I'm going to talk you through a text that I have here. It's an authentic text. That is to say, it wasn't specially written for the purposes of a textbook or for the purposes of this uh, webinar. This is the text. I'll give you a minute or so to read it because it's kind of important that you uh, get a feel for the text uh, before we move on and have a look at it in more detail. So I'm just going to shut up and let you read the text. Okay, I hope that's given you a chance to engage with the text. Notice that I didn't read it aloud to you, or that would be an option in the classroom. I don't think having the learners read aloud the text is of a great deal of use, but sometimes I think for a short text at least, or parts of it, it's quite useful if the teacher reads it aloud because that way they can break it up into its sense groups. Okay, let's have a look at this text then. This is a chance for you to respond. Uh, the first question is, what kind of text is it? What's its type? What type of text is it? So, um, not a trick question. Should be fairly obvious from the layout uh, that it is not, for example, a poem. It's not a novel. It's not a short story. It's not a piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, uh, have you say window will appear on your screen with this question, what? and we'll give them a couple of seconds mm -hmm. yeah, to reply. So again, what kind of text is it? Okay, so Beatriz, thank you Beatriz, um, she says it's a formal email. Okay. Uh, and you've spotted, yes, uh, the, the register, the style, that it's, would you say very formal? I would say it's, they've got formal features. Um, it's, now, whether it's an email or not, we'll come to shortly. 
Another uh, person says it's an email, Jesus, without uh -huh. saying what style. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yes, you're absolutely right. It's an email and it takes the form of a letter traditionally. But of course, it's, uh, as we'll see in a, in a minute, it's been transmitted digitally, though it needn't have been. There's nothing there that you can see which tells you necessarily that it's an email. But maybe you're one step ahead of me and you're recognizing the kind of email that it is. Well, here's another question uh, for you. Where, well, we've answered that in a sense. Where do you think I found it? Because remember I said it was an authentic text. So I found it somewhere. And I think you've already answered that. I found it as an email message in my in tray. So we can, we can move on from that question to the next question. Mm -hmm. So who is the text addressed to? Okay, again, another have you say on your screen. Who is it addressed to? We'll give you 10, 15 seconds to reply. This is a delayed reply here, not mm -hmm. formal beginnings and endings for mm -hmm. Nana Valley. A friend, possibly, Maria Pilar says. Okay. Uh, is it? The bank. <laughs> <laughs> Bear teeth. <laughs> In fact, uh, the person addressed is not named and we'll come back to that point in a minute, but I kind of gave the clue away by saying this was an email that I found. So in fact, it was sent to me, mm -hmm. but that information is, is hidden. Mm -hmm. What's easier to answer is the next question, who is it from? Who is it from? Yes. So the same. A colleague at work, a friend, Exactly. From Carmen, for mm -hmm. example. And Christian says the same, a friend possibly. Yeah. Okay. So it does seem to uh, be, in that sense, relatively informal. It's just signed Jeff. And Jeff is, in fact, a person I know. So he is a friend of mine. He has my email address. So when I received this, I recognized immediately uh, who it was from. And uh, as I say, although it wasn't addressed to me by name, it was a private communication between me and Jeff. How was it delivered? Well, I've said that already, I've answered that uh, by email. And what is the purpose of the text? If you'd like to answer this question, I'll give you a second okay, or two. Okay, another have you say why. So what is the purpose of this text? Again, please write your answers, they can be short. Okay, the person, somebody is asking for, the person is asking for a favor from Eva Maria, mm -hmm. thank you. And Agnes says somebody needs money. Exactly. So both those answers capture exactly. So this is asking a favor and specifically asking for a loan of money. So uh, that captures exactly the purpose of the text. So let's just go back and look at those questions. Uh, and this is, this in a sense, the outer layer of the, lung, uh, of the onion, using the metaphor that I started with, uh, or the packing case, the outer uh, packing case. So the question, what kind of text is, it is, is a question about what's called its genre or its text type. Is it a letter? Is it a poem? Is it an advertisement? And so on. We've established that it is, of the general type of, of text, a letter. Where, the question where, where did I find it, uh, that homes in on the actual context. And as I say, I found it on my email or in my email in tray. And the two questions, who to and who from, identify the participants. Now notice that you can ask these questions about any text. Any text, you should be able to identify what kind of text it is, where it's likely to have been found, and who the person who, is, who wrote the text or spoke the text and who is addressed. And finally, um, well not finally, penultimately, the question how, that is to say what kind of mode, what is the mode of the text? Is it spoken? Is it written? If it's written, is it written on paper? Is it digitally written? If it's spoken, is it spoken directly? Or is it spoken over the phone, for example? So these are the, what we might call the mode. And finally, 
The why question is about the function, the purpose of the text. So just to reiterate, all these questions can, should be able to be asked and answered about any text. Sometimes it won't always be obvious who wrote it or who it's written to, uh, but it should be quite clear what the purpose of the text is and what the genre of the text is. So those questions you can ask about any text, and that's in a say, kind of a way of, of, of unpeeling the first layer of our onion. Okay, so the next layer, we need now to go in a little bit deeper. We've established these basic, if you like, gist questions about the nature of the text. But now we, we need to unpack the actual, uh, the sense of the text. It's not enough just to say it's an email. It's not enough just to say it's about asking for money. We need to know the exact circumstances. Uh, and so this is where we start to ask questions. Given that this is a kind of narrative, the obvious questions are to to ask what happened and where. Uh, and this is, this is a way of addressing the basic uh, story, if you like, of the text and how and what happened then and so on. Now, how do we ask these questions? Well, what is the result? What are we aiming at here? We're aiming at the, to unpack the mental representation that the learner has in their head about what the text means, what is called the schema of the text. That's the, that's the kind of the story, if you like, if it's a narrative of the text. What are the stages of the text in what order, etc. And of course, there's lots of classroom, lots of tasks that we can use in the classroom which address this to unpeel that layer of the onion. For example, if it's a narrative, we can ask learners to order pictures, if we've got pictures, of the actual sequence of activities. Or we could ask them to uh, say whether statements about the text are true or false, traditional comprehension questions, of course. Or we could even ask them, uh, if they share the same language, to give us a translation of the text, or at least of the gist of the text, which is one way of checking whether they have the schema. It's very, very important before we go on to the next stage that they have more or less a standardized mental picture of what the text is about. Now this may mean, of course, uh, homing in on some of the difficult vocabulary, uh, teaching the vocabulary, checking understanding of individual words, and so on. It's incredibly important, though, before we move in to the next stage of the onion, that they have this general understanding of the text. Okay, so what's the next stage of the onion? The next stage is looking at the text not so much as a vehicle of information, but looking at at it as a kind of linguistic object. Uh, one of the things that often happens with texts in the classroom, we treat them as, uh, as uh, springboards, if you like, for uh, discussion. So let's read the text, let's talk about it. Or we may, it may simply be to practice the skills of reading uh, and or listening. One area I think is sometimes neglected in text is looking at the actual language of the text in more detail. Uh, there's a danger, I think, that we, can, we treat text a little bit superficially and ignore their rich potential that they have in terms of both the grammar, the vocabulary, and also the, the way that they're organized as a text. So, for, what, for example, we can ask learners to um, find words or expressions relating to a particular topic in the text. Yeah? So, just skim through the text and find all the words that relate to the topic of... Dot, 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 dot. For example, in this... Um, I've highlighted words that relate to a particular topic. Can you tell me what that topic is? Again, you can key in mm -hmm. your answer. Exactly. Again, have you say, what is the topic? Please write in your answers. And I will try and stop myself from giving the answer. <laughs> 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 so what is the topic general topic of the highlighted words if you should be able to see that there are a number of words and expressions in yellow Travel, Lourdes says. Uh-huh. 
Okay, so there's words like pay for a ticket, hotel bills. But there are also words like credit cards and lend me some quick funds. So can we be more specific? Okay, let's think outside of the travel topic. I'm, I'm focusing on words like um, credit, pay, bills, bank, funds, which clearly can relate to travel, but are specifically money. related to money. Exactly. Thank so you, there's a Carolina. whole thread of words in the text which relate to money. And notice that they are kind of useful expressions, some of these. They are collocations. So settle a bill, for example. Uh, lend me some funds, uh, as well as um, pay for a ticket, for example. So there's a, a kind of a seam, if you like, of vocabulary uh, or phrases running through that text. Here's another uh, set of ex uh, well, uh, well, we could look at other uh, expressions in the specifically related to travel, like passport, etc. But moving on, uh, let's have a look at some of the grammar items in the text. So in a second I'm going to highlight a number of grammatical items in the text and I invite you to tell me what these, uh, what the particular grammatical area is. You should be able to see them now highlighted in blue. Okay, once again another have you say. What's the grammar highlighted in blue? So the words are, shall we say the words just in case? They can't see. Okay, you. having to, have to, can't, can, need to, will, and can again. Okay. So let's see. Ah. That's fine. So the words or expressions are having to, have to, can't, need to, can. Can is repeated. And will. Modal. What kind of words? Yes. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> okay, so they're all different and ex Christina. <laughs> expressions of modality, either modal verbs or modal phrases. Uh, and there's a number of them in this text. And that's in itself interesting because a text which has a lot of modal verbs in uh, m could either be a text. Uh, making deductions or assumptions or it could be a, a text which has is reaching out in a kind of personal way uh, and so it's not surprising perhaps given the function of the text which is asking a favor that there's a lot of modality in it okay one more grammatical area I've highlighted I hope you can see these I'll read them out they're in green this time what do they have in common reach out come up with give back and get in. So what's the grammar? What's the type of language? Reach out, come up with, give back, get in. Phrasal verbs. Well done, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. The same, Maria Pilar, thank Absolutely. you very much. And Beatriz. The much loved and feared phrasal <laughs> verbs. So there's at least four of them in this text. Now, that's the kind of activity which uh, learners can do uh, working together. So you can give them a worksheet, for example, find examples of, or what are the, what do they have in common, the underlined words or the highlighted words. It's a way, as I say, of peeling back the text and looking at it now as a linguistic object, yeah? as a source of linguistic knowledge, if you like, uh, rather than simply as a vehicle for information. And there's lots and lots of other really interesting areas of grammar that we could focus on in this text. And I've just identified two. And vocabulary, of course. Just remember we looked at uh, vocabulary related to money, uh, modal verbs, and phrasal verbs. Um, okay, so here's our onion now. It's starting to get smaller and smaller. I'm getting right to the heart of the onion. Uh, and I'm going to ask a question now which is not so much about what's, what you can see in the text, it's what you can infer from the text. That is to say, what is the hidden message of the text? What's the real purpose of this text? And some of you may have 
uh, identify this because you are familiar with this kind of text. We've said before that the purpose of the text was uh, asking a favor, uh, but is that the real purpose of the text? I'll, ask, I'll invite you again to respond here. Exactly. Again, on your screen you will see the question, what's the real purpose of this text? Please and maybe related to that, how do you know? And how do you know, exactly. Maria Jesus says, to trick you <laughs> into giving the, you, the money. Mm -hmm. Well done. Them, not Jeff. <laughs> His account has been hacked. Absolutely, well done. <laughs> wow, so, what insight. <laughs> how did you know is the next question. You're absolutely right. It's, it's a, a scamming email uh, to get me to send money to the person who is not Jeff. Uh, but is pretending to be Jeff. Now, how did you know that? I'll give you again a chance to respond. Okay, so Maria Jesus in particular, because you've nailed it, how did you know that this was a scam? Ah, well, somebody else has suggested that the last sentence before the closing one. Okay, so the gives last sentence away. before the closing one, there I really need to be on the next available flight. Now, why, uh, Suzanne, oh no, that was Beatrice. No, this is Beatrice, she's Beatrice, saying, well, why did you say that? Why, what, what, what's it about that? Is it that the sentence that you mean? I really need to be on the next available flight? We'll see what she says. And if not, Suzanne is saying, Jeff needs money, he is asking for money. Well, yeah, I mean, we've it's established, I think, that it might not be Jeff, but I'm yeah. wondering what clues are there in the text which exactly. make you a little bit suspicious. Yes. And that made me suspicious well, when I'm I read Well, I'm curious it. to hear from Maria, Maria Jesus. You were very clear in your answer and you mm -hmm. nailed it straight away. So what do you think? Okay, it's not, it's so neutral, she says. You're not addressed directly. It just feels fake. Okay, well spotted. So first of all, it seems odd that uh, the writer didn't, if he claims to know me, and it is, was from Jeff's email. They didn't say, hello, Scott. So that does seem to be inconsistent with the relationship that we have as friends. So that was the first thing, yes, that sort of raised my suspicions. Mm -hmm. Doesn't use your name. Doesn't use your name. Uh, the last sentence, the English is quite poor. poor. English. Uh -huh. There's no personal information. Okay. Thank you, So Sophia. the last sentence, I will be waiting to read from you soon. It's now, that is odd. You never, I'd be waiting to hear from you maybe, but not waiting to read from you. So this would suggest that the person who wrote the letter doesn't have a complete command of the English language. Now, Jeff, who the Jeff I know uh, is a native speaker of English, is not the kind of error that I would expect him to make, even though he may be under a lot of pressure. Uh, so that is another clue, a linguistic clue, which raised my suspicions. I'll show you a few others that made me think twice about the real author of this text. We've already mentioned that uh, he doesn't address me by my name, which seemed unusual. He said, I made a trip early to Malaysia. Now, I don't know, does that sound natural to you? Louise? No, it doesn't made a trip early. I made a know. trip. No, this sounds like it's cobbled together. It's not the kind of collocation. No, no. No. That no. I would think would be natural and early. I don't know what that what, means. What's that supposed to say yeah. to us? Yeah. What, what? Recently, maybe, or all yeah. of a sudden, or yeah. early? Yeah, no. That seems odd. For a program. Now, what program? Yeah, I would <laughs> say for a conference, maybe, for a meeting, for whatever. But for a program, it's too vague. Yes. Uh, so again, it, it, it makes me feel that this is something not what a, a proficient speak, speak or writer of the language would say. Then we've got the capitalization of hotel. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, we make, everybody makes typos, so we perhaps shouldn't give this too much weight, but it starts to add up. And then 
He says, I can give back as soon as I get in. Now, getting in, yeah, that's a correct phrasal verb, but not for returning from a journey. You would say, what would you say when, as soon as getting I get back? Get back. Exactly. exactly. So, all these clues, these linguistic clues, alerted me to the fact that the real writer was not Jeff, and the real purpose was not to ask a favor, but was to, as um, somebody said, to trick me into sending money. So this is an authentic email. Those of you who have received emails like that will recognize them. But it is, you're absolutely right, it was the case that Jeff's computer had been hacked and so on. So what we're doing here is moving in uh, to the real core of the text through these different stages. But we couldn't get to the core of the text until perhaps we've gone through these successive stages. So I just want to make a distinction here between two things I've been talking about. Using the text as a kind of vehicle of information, that is to say, it's telling us something, what is it telling us? And then looking at the text as a linguistic object, looking at the grammar and vocabulary, etc. of the text, in that order. Looking at it first as a vehicle of information and looking at it as a linguistic object. And this in turn divides into at least three stages. The, the first stage, the outside layer of the London, uh, of, why do I keep saying London? The, the <laughs> onion, uh, which gives us the kind of a superficial reading. It's those questions about what kind of text, where did, it, where did you find it, who's it to, who's it from, etc. What's it about? Uh, and then a more intensive reading where we're trying to unpeel the different stages of the narrative, if it is a narrative. Uh, and then looking at it as a linguistic object through a more analytic reading, looking at the, um, the vocabulary and the, and the grammar, etc., as I said. Maybe going even further and analyzing the subtext of the text, once we've got to know it very uh, we're very familiar with it. So the subtext being, as I say, its real purpose, which is not revealed necessarily until we've gone through different stages. So just going back to my metaphor there, we're looking at a text as a succession of layers and that we need to approach each layer deliberately and in turn and not try to do too much too soon. That is my argument and I'm I would add that you can apply this approach to any text, uh, whether it's a text in the course book or a text that you bring into the classroom or a text indeed that the students find themselves on the internet, for example. Uh, and uh, I would also add that, as I said earlier, that it's worth going that extra mile with the text not just using it superficially, but looking at the grammar and vocabulary, even if the, tech, the course book doesn't invite you to do that, it's a, it's a good thing to do because every text embeds really interesting features. Now, the text you choose may not have a subtext like the text that I got from supposed Jeff, but nevertheless, um, there's always some, if it's an authentic text particularly, there's always something interesting to be said about it. And literary text, text lit, literary texts, of course, are very good because they don't necessarily show uh, on the surface what they're really about. So they lend themselves to, dis to discussion. Okay, we're going to, that's my bit done. Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity to send any questions you have about what I've been talking about uh, or about text, the use of text generally in the classroom. So I'm going to wait a, a mm. moment or two. Uh, and, and they could also send in any comments about what they do in their own absolutely. classes, how they approach, how you approach using text um, in your classes. Um, it would be interesting now to hear. Um, you've given me a lot of food for thought. I haven't been in the classroom for a little while, but um, I'm not sure now, thinking back, that I really actually exploited all mm -hmm. those layers. Mm -hmm to quite that extent? Well, I mean, one of the problems, of course, in the classroom is that texts are often, especially at higher levels, are quite long, so they don't lend themselves to be mm -hmm. this kind of analysis within the space of a lesson that yes. takes time. You know, one way around that may be to get the learners to read the text in advance of the class yes. so that they come prepared, uh, and then you can spend that time in the class, like zooming in on that. Yes. The, through the yes. layers of the, lung, uh, of the onion. Exactly, but we often focus so much on the comprehension, you know? Mm -hmm. 
have you understood the main idea? Well, of course, that's really what does that yeah. actually mean? It's very important that yeah. the stu as I said before, that the learners do understand the text, but but that needn't mm. be the point w which you stop. Exactly, and we do generally, I think, s tend to stop at that mm. point, mm. or then we use, for example, the reading text then as a springboard yes. for a writing mm -hmm. activity, which is perfectly legitimate, but, but it maybe may. Uh, ignore some of the useful exactly. linguistic features of the text. Exactly. The other thing about the linguistic features of the text, it's tempting to think that just because the text is in the unit of the book, which is about the present perfect, for example, that that's all we need to focus on, the examples of the present perfect and the text. But that perhaps ignores some of the other rich associated language uh, mm. that's worth looking exactly. at as well. Exactly. So I think, again, what I'm inviting you to do is not take a too uh, narrow Blinkered. view yeah, mm. of the text, but exactly. to kind of stand back from the text and say, what kind of interesting yeah. stuff is But in also here? to be systematic about it as well. Okay, so now we've got from Ana Garcia. Thank you, Ana. Every day we need to analyze more videos. Okay, so videos are texts mm -hmm. too. And I'm thinking of how you could use YouTube videos, for mm -hmm. example, which especially if you've got the transcript, that these are fantastic because these are often unscripted uh, examples of spoken language and we don't have enough of those. Uh, and if you've got the transcript of the video, you can see the person speaking or if the people interacting, if it's a clip of a film or whatever. But again, you can do the same kind of analysis. First of all, the general, the outer layer of the onion, who, what, where, when, why, and then going in. Now, what are they talking about? Um, activating the kind of schema, the mental representation of what's going on. And now let's look at the transcript and look at some interesting features of the text. Now if it's spoken language, we can look at some interesting features of spoken language, for example, hesitations, interruptions, back channel devices and so on. <laughs> Agnes wants to know, has anybody ever answered this kind of text? Yeah, would you do a writing follow-up on this <laughs> and to see what, what happened next? Well, now there's an activity. Curiosity acti kills yeah. the cat. <laughs> there's an activity for the classroom. If you've got a text like this, then get the learners to write a response. Exactly. Pretending to be me. Exactly. Uh, res responding to the pretend <laughs> Jeff. That would be kind of fun. That would be great fun. Well, there you have your follow-up task. Mm -hmm. Um, Tanya says, what I learned at university is that we should use scaffolding, mm -hmm. basically progressing little by little. Um, let me just go down. Uh, do you think it would be a good idea, this is from Tanya, mm -hmm. to provide a kind of general script, mm -hmm. depending on the genre, whether we're working mm -hmm. with recipes mm -hmm. or letters or yes. essays? I think that's something that, in fact, the learners can be invited to do. So if they've got a particular text Type, let's say it's an essay, a discursive essay, and uh, presenting an argument or the pros and cons, uh, or if it's a more simple kind of text like a recipe and that, have them identify themselves what the actual script is, if, as you say, what the, what the, con how the text is constructed, what comes first, what comes second. The best way of doing this, of course, is if you've got several examples of the same text. So they can look and say, now what do all these texts have got in common? Ah, they've got an introductory paragraph, then they've got a presentation of the argument, then the contrary argument, and so on. So yes, I think that's an excellent uh, approach. And um, Lanya asks, can it be done with pictures as well? Uh, well, the pictures can support the understanding of the text. And I think where you can use pictures to support a text, that's ideal. And if a text comes with a picture, for example, it's a news, a news story and it has a picture, then exploit the picture. Yeah, ask questions about the picture, again, to kind of activate the schema so that it's easier for the learners to process the text when they read it. Beatrice makes a good point that, um, well, they may, she, she gets students to read text at home mm. to maximise the time in class. However, obviously, um, in schools, they're under pressure to prepare students for external exams. Yeah. And so maybe sometimes the um, focus, this deeper um, focus on, on mm. understanding texts is maybe mm. not. Yes. Um, Although I'll say that a lot of exams nowadays, I'm thinking of the Cambridge suite of exams, are based almost entirely on text. And so experience of using text and, and looking at text in some detail in the classroom is actually very good preparation for exams which yes. also are text based. Yes, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Scott. That's been really, really inspiring. Eh? And I hope, you know, 
everybody out there that you will be um, inspired to go away and look at text in, in, in a deeper, deeper, deeper way. Look at the layers, unpack the layers and um, invite your students to really um, look at text in, in to see text in a, a slightly different um, way, uh, different from being just a reading comprehension. Yes, yeah, seeing no? them as a resource. As a yeah. resource, exactly, for lots of investigation. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louise, a pleasure. Thank you. We hope that you have found these teacher training videos of real use and relevance to your classes. We would like to remind you that you can find many more practical teaching ideas and tips, articles and video clips in Macmillan Advantage. Don't miss this opportunity to continue your professional development.